climate change, shifting the promise clean energy, but at what cost? We will be collateral damage. It will cause an economic impact on this industry. From the seas to the streets, hybrid electric vehicles. Those combine a gas engine and also a battery. Plug-in vehicles. You can plug those in and they give you a, a little all-electric charge. Fully electric cars. Is Southern New England ready to meet the challenge? This is an NBC 10, your voice, your future town hall, climate conversation. Hello everyone, and welcome to this special NBC 10 town hall on climate change. We come to you along the beautiful coastline of Matunic and here on the deck of the iconic Ocean Mist restaurant. So good to have you along with us, everyone. I'm Dan Janik. And I'm Mark Searles. And tonight we're gonna to discuss several, but not all the aspects involved with our shifting climate. And while we certainly can't attribute every storm to climate change, there is no doubt that a warming ocean presents the potential for stronger storms. And with that, more coastal erosion. Mm. And there's certainly no greater example of that than right here at the Ocean Mist of Matunic. Take a look at the view from here years ago. The beachfront was vast enough for people to play volleyball and enjoy the beach. But now, in 2023... Yeah, take a look just to today, for instance. The water is not even at high tide, and it's right up to the restaurant. During high tide, the water actually splashes underneath the restaurant. And no one's seen the progression more than Ocean Mist's owner, Kevin Finnegan. You could stand on the beach, and kind of your head would be about a little above the deck, so you could hand or jump over the railing. Uh, so the erosion between, you know, combination, I think, what you guys are working on, global warming, sea level rises, but you got the... You know, long shot drift and you got a harbor refuge and breachways. It's great. You know, it's nice that you open up the conversation of the possibilities, what's causing it. So Kevin's owned the Ocean Mist almost as long as I've been forecasting the weather in southern New England. I've been referring to this as a pattern of extremes for years. We get these wild swings yeah. of hot episodes, cold episodes, rain events, lack of snow, etc. Yeah, and we've all seen it, right? The mild, mild temperatures during typical winter months, storms that bring heavy flooding, even tornadoes in southern New England. So let's all break it down now. What is climate change? To define climate change, let's break it down into its simplest form and look at the two words. We'll start with climate. Climate refers to expected weather conditions for a specific area over a certain period of time. What is our average high temperature for a specific date, March 15th? Or the average amount of snowfall we expect in a winter season? Or the average amount of rainfall over a calendar year in Providence? That is climate. When that changes, obviously that becomes different. So to have those average or expected weather conditions change from year to year or over a specific yearly set. Now I've noticed those changes through my career. Young Mark, back in the 1990s, look at the average January and July high and low temperatures. In my nearly 30 year career, that January average high temperature has risen over two degrees and the low temperature nearly three degrees. The winter season is warming faster than any of the other seasons in our area. And that holds true for most of the country, by the way. We're noticing in the last 50 years in Providence, a nearly five degree average temperature increase from 1970 to the early 2020s. And we're seeing fewer nights dropping below 32 degrees. In fact, 16 fewer nights per year now drop below freezing. That's climate change. And just for the record, there's no way you're going to blame your age on climate change. But anyways, we are here in Studio B for our roundtable discussions on climate change. I'm joined by John Torgan, State Director of the Nature Conservancy and Brown University Professor at the Institute for Environment and Society, Meredith Hastings. And on my side, we have Terry Gray, the Director of the Rhode Island DEM, and Priscilla De La Cruz, the Director of Sustainability for the City of Providence. Thank you all for being here. I do want to make fun of myself for one second. No, 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 no. <laughs> Young Mark and old Mark. Um, let's start with Meredith. Meredith, I've, I've had the pleasure of coming into your classroom at Brown now for well over a decade. And it's safe to say that when I was first invited to your climate discussion, um, I was a little bit skeptical about the specifics of climate change. And certainly my opinion on that has shifted as I've been witnessing the events unfold here in Southern England for the last 10 to 15 years. What can you tell us about climate change, the specifics? What are we seeing here in the state of Rhode Island? Um, I mean, I think you pointed out a few of the particulars, you know, in terms of the average temperature changes, right? But it's not just the average changes, it's the seasonal 
um, changes. So we're seeing you know more of an increase in winter when our temperatures are colder, right? Um, we're seeing you know hotter summers and and longer um, heat waves um, than we've seen in the past. Um, a big issue for our state is coastal flooding um, and sea level rise is undeniable, right? I mean, anyone who lives on the coast will tell you that. Absolutely, and I think if I could, just one, one word that I like to use is extremes, right? A pattern of extremes, and I've noticed that over these last, certainly the last decade, the last 15, 20 years or so, uh, the extreme events, the flooding events, uh, the droughts. Um, if I could go to John real quick, John, um, we go back to your years with Save the Bay. Uh, as the baykeeper, mm -hmm. and uh, you are a lifelong resident. You've fished these waters. You've noticed things changing. Yeah, Mark, in, in all that time, um, we've seen a lot of things change. As the professor pointed out, we have warmer winters. We have warmer ocean and bay water temperatures. There's been uh, uh, increasing fire risk and weird weather events. So it's not always that it's warmer. Sometimes we get really, really cold snaps that are also related to climate change. And so it's, it's important this sort of global weirding is, is maybe a better term for what we're experiencing in Rhode Island. And that drives the cast of characters, the fish species, the bird species, the insects, all of the plants and animals that we're seeing are also changing. You know, we used to have so many of these classic cold water things like lobster mm. and winter flounder, um, haddock and pollock, and these things are nearly gone from Rhode Island waters. And, and we now we're seeing more things like, um, you know, more uh, jellyfish and more black sea bass, more squid, right. you know, which is good for our, our friends in the changing coastal changing landscape fishing. beneath mm. the sea. Landscape and seascape. Right. Bird species changing and, and not always for the better. Right. And Priscilla, and from a city view, we've just seen it recently in Providence, the flooding. Talk to us a little bit about how you're seeing it in the city of Providence. So I should start off by saying that in the city of Providence, we've we've acknowledged climate change uh, for 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 many years, um, but in particular the inequities of that that change in climate. Um, so when we think about um, the the goal behind our climate justice plan was to say climate change is happening, and we have to make sure that people and communities remain resilient throughout a changing climate, um, but also that we are working on some of the preventatives and not um, making the crisis worse than what it is. From an advocate city, city level perspective, we've been following those changes to the Department of Sustainability and also the Providence Emergency Management Agency. Um, but for the rest of Providence, all of our residents and all of our businesses is undeniable what we've been seeing the past several weeks. Right. We had a very unusual summer. Um, um, a very unusual start of our fall when we're going from extreme heat days where we've had to close down our schools um, and provide cooling centers and libraries right. um, and then going to extreme flooding events where right. we've had to um, ask businesses to shut down like in Branch Avenue um, during those flooding events. Right. You see the impacts on a state level, Terry. All of the above. And, and just, to, just to reiterate some of the points that the other panelists raised, one, sea level rise. You look at the tidal gauge in Newport, it's, the sea level has risen nine inches since 1930, oh, wow. mm -hmm. and it's accelerating. Um, you look at the extreme weather events, and we see that through our dam safety program, through our water quality programs, where these, these real deluges of rain and drought conditions, they, they kind of cycle back and forth, and it's very unpredictable. The droughts are really stressing our forests. Like John said, there's new insects, there's, there's dryness. Mm -hmm. It's killing trees, which then creates a forest fire mm -hmm. hazard. And last spring, we saw the two worst forest fires we've seen in Rhode Island in 50 years. That's not something that we're used to dealing with. Yeah. So we really have to look at it. And even anecdotally, I grew up on the bay in, um, in Warwick. And when I was a kid, the bay used to freeze. And it, that's, that's not an issue anymore. We used to play pond hockey a lot, a lot of ice fishing. All of those are really unpredictable right now and rare occurrences. Yeah, That's great. We'll hold it right there for now. Mm -hmm. But coming up on this NBC10 Climate Town Hall, the pros and cons of offshore wind farms. And we'll hear from our local fishing community and their concerns. Welcome back to our NBC 10 Town Hall on climate change. You know, we've been hearing and likely seeing a lot of offshore wind here in southern New England. I traveled to Block Island to visit the nation's first offshore commercial wind farm, which has been operating for seven years now and appears to be a success for many islanders. 
Black Island now stakes its reputation, I believe, on its environmental resources, whether it's bird uh, watching, people come out all times of the year to bird watch, uh, hiking, swimming, boating, you know, the whole thing. So now what do you do? Kim Gaffett isn't just a bird watcher, she's a bird lover. Put the band on it already, I've already done it. This lifelong Block Islander and environmentalist has monitored their migration patterns for over 40 years. When talk of offshore wind turbines started 10 years ago. Sure, you always have reservations. Um, uh, ecological reservations, um, but they were pretty quickly addressed. Addressed by a team of scientists and a professor from Denmark who's an expert on birds and wind farms. I was pretty quickly convinced that it was not going to be a hazard to the birds for the most part for a number of reasons. Um, and, you know, they did a lot of mitigation for right whale. And, and so far, she hasn't seen any change to the birds she studies, but research is still being done. They're still monitoring, uh, I know through URI, they're still monitoring some of the bird activity to make sure there's no uh, adverse impact. The one thing that I do know is, you know, offshore wind works, and it works about twice as good as the ridgetop, you know, wind projects that are in the, you know, northern New England. In late December of 2016, history was made three miles offshore of Block Island. When these five wind turbines came online, they were the first commercial offshore wind farm in North America. And for the islanders that we spoke to, they tell us that was a game changer. Since 1925, the island's been run off from diesel 24-7, um, 365. Um, they used to burn about a million gallons of fuel every year. With the wind farms, that was only about 5,000 gallons last year, and they say that's just when the turbines and the power line has to be turned off for maintenance. Jeff Wright is the president of Block Island Power. The majority of the energy that comes off this wind farm goes to the mainland. Um, the amount of energy that gets generated here will supply power to 17,000 homes in Rhode Island. Today happens to be one of those rare days when there's virtually no wind on Block Island. The turbines are not spinning. But that's not a problem. According to the power company, they factor in days like this when they give their grid output. The reason that they don't spin is not only just because of wind, but they have maintenance outages. They have, you know, cable outages. They've got a variety of things, just like any generator um, that'll shut them down occasionally. But for the most part, out here, the wind blows most of the time, and for the majority of the time, they're spinning. But what works for Block Island may not necessarily work for other communities. And he admits the price tag of offshore wind farms is alarming but says on Block Island, it paid off in the end. So right now it's expensive and Block Island was expensive because it was new, mm -hmm. um, but eventually, you know, the economy of scale is gonna drive that price down. Yeah. Solar is great. Solar only works when the sun shines. Right. The wind, especially out here, it blows all the time. You know, the main takeaway for me is that the grid on Block Island mm -hmm. is much more reliable. There's no more reliance on the burning of diesel fuel. That's amazing. You talk about a million right. gallons, exactly. right? Uh, bottom line, the residents of the island say the energy costs, they haven't gone down, but they haven't gone up either. They're much more stable. Right. And, but Block Island's a small community. And it pales in comparison to other planned projects, which, of course, calls for more turbines. Yeah, and what we've learned in our coverage is that one size doesn't fit all. But on the other side is, of course, our local fishermen, who I've spent time with recently. And they tell me offshore wind farms will destroy their livelihood. Proud Mary was an homage to my wife, at the time standing proud over the family. Captain Chris Brown grew up fishing out of the Narragansett port with his granddad. It's one of the last romantic ways uh, to make a living in this country nowadays. The ocean, their office, the profession, their passion. What is the fish that you catch the most of? Squid right now. Okay. Squid, uh, squid is a, it looks to be one of the survivors in climate change. Squid, the biggest catch here, doesn't seem to be moving away from the wind farms like most other species. I am seeing a loss of uh, fishing opportunity in and around the wind farms. Uh, scup, codfish, mackerel, whiting. We don't catch those from the wind farms north on the east side of the island anymore. It's not a population thing. It's a, them choosing not to be in and around the noise, the havoc, the, the electromagnetic fields. Brown and other fishermen say once the five turbines near Block Island turned on, most of their catch, especially lobsters, left. Uh, the year before, uh, the wind turbines out here in Block Island were electrified when they were simply vertical structure. I fished in and around the pylons and caught a, a bunch of codfish, a lot. I had a very good year, the best year I had ever had 
in and around that area. The next year they hit the switch. Electricity, vibration, noise started coursing through the water. I don't think I caught a box, 100 pounds. They have seen now over the years a dramatic reduction, especially in lobsters. Fred Matera is president of the Rhode Island Fisheries and wow. represents local fishermen. We're already dealing with climate change, and that climate change is a shift of species. Some of the species we had here for many decades are now starting to move further to the north. The turbines, he says, adding to that, and he predicts at least dozens more in the coming years. Lobsters spawn codfish, crabs, scallops, they all spawn. When things that live on the bottom reduce, uh, release their eggs, they hatch and form a larvae. They rise to the top. Captain Brown explains the other impact. One of the when farms out there is going to have a, a transformer. It's going to transform AC to DC. It's going to suck in 8 million gallons of water a day. It's going to kill all the floating larvae of those species. You know, we will be collateral damage. It will cause um, an economic impact on this industry. With more and more of these wind farms being constructed, the other concern for local fishermen out at sea is their safety. Picture, if you will, these dock pylons are the turbines, and I'm the fishing vessel going in and out of port each day. Their job now is to maneuver around them. And that presents a new challenge. Look at my boat compared to all these other ones. The, the gear is proportionate. Yeah. A mile apart, one boat going one way, one boat going the other. I don't think they're going to make it. We're going to be talking over a thousand of these here, oh, 10, 15, 20 miles away. A thousand in the next five or six years. Like an obstacle course. Like an obstacle course. It's unsafe. Local fishermen love these waters. You form a bond with the ocean. But not the newest species whose population seems to be growing like the squid. Is there a concern? Is there a nervousness? Oh, every single one, if you asked every single fisherman here, they would tell you, end it, stop it. It's oh. our demise. Okay, coming up, we will talk with the fishing industry and the state about the future of these two industries. And we're going to tell you why you won't be hearing from the company behind the local wind farms off our local coast when we return with our Climate Roundtable. And we are back with our panel of experts on offshore wind and the fishing industry. Terry Gray is the director of the Rhode Island DEM. Fred Matera is the executive director of the Commercial Fisheries Center of Rhode Island. And Megan Lapp, who represents the fishing industry and specific facilities. Megan has testified before U.S. lawmakers on the issue. That's right. Who is not here is Orsted, the company behind the major offshore wind projects. They were scheduled to participate, but canceled less than 24 hours before this taping and could not make anyone from their company available. Terry, we want to begin with you because you are right in the middle. You don't really represent the wind farms. You don't represent the fishermen. You represent the taxpayers. As far as the state, what are the pros and cons of offshore wind turbines? Dan, it, it really comes down to two parts of our mission. One part, which is the more recent part of our mission, is the state's really got to invest and rely on renewable energy for the future. It's part of our climate plan. It's really important to, to comply with the Rhode Island Act on Climate. But a longstanding part of our mission is to protect, regulate, and advocate for the fishing community, the commercial fishers in particular. So we kind of have to balance this. Yeah, tightrope. Right, it is a tightrope. <laughs> and it's, um, it's not unusual. There's a lot of times when, when we deal with conflicting uses of different resources, this is the first time it's really kind of come to a head, a head in the ocean. And so let's go over to Fred and Megan. Either of you want to take this question. Obviously, from the commercial fishing standpoint, we saw in that piece right there uh, the change that that uh, captain was referencing offshore, right? The year before, the amount of cod that he cap was able to catch. And then once the power comes on, how things have changed. What are you hearing from your constituents? Well, everything's new. You know, that's the problem with this. We haven't experienced this before. It's all novel. Mm -hmm. And what we want to make certain is we don't become collateral damage. Mm -hmm. How can we coexist into the future? So as Chris has represented there and stated, um, some of the issues are we're seeing shifts in species. 
And what's causing that? You know, is it electric magnetic fields? Is it sound vibration? Um, we need better science. We need more sound science in order to be able to determine that and hopefully continue to thrive and continue to fish. So I would say too, Megan, if I could follow up on that, um, we were probably seeing a shift in species prior to the electrification of the Block Island wind farm, right? We, you're talking about a warming ocean. We're seeing, I've heard about black sea bass. Uh, appearing, the winter flounder disappearing, the lobsters migrating north with a warming ocean, right? So this all began prior to that, but have you noticed it has changed even more so since Block Island came online? Well, you know, really from our perspective, one of the things that we fish for um, primarily, the vessels that I represent, is squid, right? Mm -hmm. Squid is, Rhode Island is a calamari state. It's very, very important to this state. And what we do know about squid and their response to the types of um, impacts that will be generated by offshore wind farms is that low frequency sound emanates from vibrating monopiles, not like the Block Island turbines, but like the turbines that are planned for everywhere else. Mm -hmm. And when, when squid are exposed to that low frequency noise, it actually causes lesions in essentially their ear cavities and ca can cause fatality in squid. So we have a lot of concern because these wind farms are being sited on top of squid fishing grounds where the squid live. This is their habitat. And now they're going to be exposed to low frequency noise for 30 years continually from structures that are 800 to over 1,000 feet tall. And that's not good. Right. That's not good for us. Now, explain the Block Island one, though, right now, because you're not seeing the squid move as much there, right? So for people watching at home, uh, is it what's the difference between the, the wind turbines you're talking about and the wind turbines that you're dealing with in Block Island? Block Island is not really a squid fishing ground. Okay. Um, primarily, a lot of the other um, offshore wind farms that are being cited by folks like Orsted, by folks like Vineyard Wind, by folks like um, Empire, or Empire Wind and Equinor and folks mm. like that um, are directly on squid grounds. And that's, that's a huge problem for us, not only from a biological standpoint, also from an operational standpoint. Um, and I think also what people need to understand is that, you know, the Block Island wind farm is five turbines, right? That's not what we're talking about for the rest of the ocean. We're talking right now, we have 2.3 million lake acres leased for offshore wind already. There is an area south of Rhode Island and Massachusetts that is bigger than the state of Rhode Island and will have a wind turbine one mile apart in every direction. The state of New York wants to expand where it wants its wind leases everywhere from the coast of New Jersey to off of Cape Cod and out to 150 miles. Mm -hmm. We have a chain of offshore wind um, farms also up and down the coast of the East Coast. And so the cumulative impact of this is that fishermen will have nowhere to go and that species that do not like the impacts of these wind turbines will also have nowhere to go. All right, and I think that's interesting. You know, maybe this is, would have been a question for Orsted, and as Dan mentioned, they're not here represented. So um, t to maybe ask you a question that I would have directed their way, we talked about in, in that piece talking about the number of, of turbines that are going to be out there, the navigational mm. hazards that these are going to that these are going to present to commercial fishermen, but to recreational boaters. To mm -hmm. let's talk about um, some of the cruise ships that come in. Are, is this something that you're hearing about that that the state's concerned about as well? We're absolutely hearing about it, uh, Mark, and we're we're concerned about it as well. But but our role role is really to be driven by the science. Mm -hmm. And like Fred said, there's a lot of uncertainty with the, re with the development of these, um, these wind farms. So we need to really in incorporate scientific surveys, scientific studies as they, as they are developed and come into the ocean. We started that with Block Island. There's a lot of work, there's a lot of data that's being collected and our division of marine fisheries is looking at all that. Um, we also are working closely with the Coastal Resources Management Council to make sure that new proposals as they come in incorporate that type of get data gathering that'll give us the answers to some of the questions that are being presented. Right. Fred, you know, uh, we obviously wanted Orsted here not for any kind of confrontation, but so that they could explain their side of the story. Um, we would have liked to hear from them. Have you talked with them and do you feel like they're hearing your voice? Yes, I have a conversation with them. I actually um, am a fisheries rep for five of the offshore wind developers. Orsted is not one of them, um, but we have a dialogue ongoing all the time. Um, I know their fish reps, and uh, so the concerns we have with Orsted is they're they're slow to respond, and their communication and outreach program and policies um, need to improve. Um, we had some issues. There's been some claims 
and they haven't addressed them appropriately. Right. And, and a lot of it would be, would be helpful if they had navigators from either Orsted to help people to fill out the claims mm -hmm. appropriately, to get compensated, and get compensated in a, in a timely fashion, right. not six months later and then give them a percentage and not the full compensation. So, right. you know, some of those things need to improve, and we do have a dialogue all Good. the time. Good, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but it goes back to coexisting. Absolutely, it's a key word, and I don't know if you can give us like a quick 10-second soundbite. What is a major impact that a consumer of seafood here in southern New England, what is one specific impact that they, they may potentially see here coming up? Um, well, if offshore wind is continues to go as is planned, um, I do not foresee the U.S. commercial fishing industry on the East Coast surviving 20 years, so you will be importing all of your seed food from somewhere else. And to your point about Orsted, I will say this. I have a document, um, it's a, a notice to U.K. fishermen from both Orsted and a U.K. Um, fishing information services, and it says on there, the vessels that harvest squid and the vessels that I represent are trawl vessels. They have nets and, you know, held by wires and things like that that can get snagged on the offshore wind farm infrastructure. And so the notice to mariners that went out from Orsted and the Kingfisher Information Service says that trawlers should stay, stay clear of um, offshore wind farms, the underwater infrastructure, because if a trawler snags on the cables or the subsea structure of the wind farm, it can, quote, cause serious risk of loss of life, end quote. Mm -hmm. And that is really what we're dealing with, and that's probably one of the reasons Orsted didn't want to be here today. All right, up next, the mayor in the middle, New Bedford's John Mitchell, welcoming an offshore wind project to the city but he hasn't forgotten his fishing roots. Welcome back to our town hall. There is one local city at the epicenter of both the fishing industry and offshore wind. Yeah, we're talking about New Bedford, one of the biggest fishing ports in the nation, and now making headlines for wind energy. We have positioned ourselves right in the middle of all of it, uh, which is, again, it's a lonely place these days to, in, in American politics mm -hmm. to be placed right in the middle. But we think that's in the city's interest because we're committed to the proposition that both industries in the long run can coexist successfully here. And so we've called balls and strikes between the two of them and have tried to get uh, them to communicate well with one another. Uh, I think it's succeeding, but you know we're playing the long game and this, this, it's, there are many innings uh, left to be played. Game on, not far from the mayor's office where history hangs above his desk, is one of the largest fishing ports in the nation. Still thriving, scallops the big catch, but flags fly from boats that make it clear how they feel about offshore wind, which just a few miles from port is where Vineyard Wind is already launching 62 offshore wind turbines. The mayor acknowledges the fisherman's feelings from a fishing family himself. He's now an umpire. New Bedford's an older industrial city. This new offshore wind industry will bring more jobs. It's hard to dispute that, how much is, is open to debate, but that there will be a substantial number of jobs is something I think is generally accepted. So what folks in the fishing industry will say is, yeah, look, I, 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 want, my, I want my hometown to do well. Uh, I just don't want it to go too far to, you know, to cause damage to my, my, uh, my own business. And so as mayor, that's uh, something that I, I take very seriously and we're looking to protect one industry while we're promoting the other. And of course, we are back with our panel of experts. I just want to again point out that we invited Orsted to have their side of the story so you could learn from that company, but they canceled less than 24 hours before this taping. With that said, Fred, Megan, I want to get back to the navigation, which I learned when I was down by the uh, pier with you, uh, just maneuvering your fishing boats through the um, wind turbines is a safety issue. Yes. Uh you know, I was fortunate enough to be one of the first fishing groups that was invited to a, uh, a simulator in uh, Middletown, uh, Rhode Island. And having experienced that, you know, I've been over 40 years at sea uh, with an 85-foot fishing vessels. We leave when the weather is calm. It's benign. And we go to sea. And I'll mm -hmm. fish four, five, six days when I come home is when it gets horrendous, when it's hellacious, and now it's windy and it's blowing. And now I have to navigate. If I go from the southeast of Rhode Island to Mass uh, fishing leased areas to the northwest, that's 85 miles. 
and I have to go through one mile, and if it's diagonal, it's seven-tenths of a mile that I have to navigate and be able to see the lights, see all the sea reactions. I'm in maybe 15, 20-foot seas. When you say one mile, you mean between each turbine? Yeah, but it's now seven-tenths. One mile is east, west, north, and south. When you go on a diagonal, that, that one mile becomes seven-tenths of a mile. You see the same thing, Megan? Yeah, one of the major problems is going to be uh, marine radar interference. Offshore wind turbines interfere with all classes of marine radar. Mm -hmm. So essentially when you're navigating in inclement weather, the fog, night, um, you have no eyes now. You have no reliable eyes. And that is a tremendously dangerous situation. Um, I've asked the Coast Guard for almost 10 years now to conduct a simulation study on the number mm -hmm. and size of turbines that are out there. They've refused, but um, actually the National Academy of Sciences came out with a study last year where they quoted my comments to the Coast Guard, and they came out and said, yes, this is a major concern, um, but there are no implementable solutions at this time. Wow, incredible. And so let's talk maybe, Terry, briefly about a positive, and let's talk about the infrastructure, the build-out. We saw a lot of work being done at the ports um, in southern New England, but specifically Rhode Island. Yeah, thanks, Mark. The, like, like we said, it's a tight balance here, so we want to both support the commercial um, fishing industry, but also look at offshore wind as a source of our renewable energy for the future. So one of the things that we've done in, in Rhode Island is Governor McKee has invested $45 million into the infrastructure in Galilee. And that, and we've been very clear that that infrastructure is solely to benefit the commercial uh, fishing community. And that, that's an important step forward. Um, at the same time, the governor's also invested in port development in Quonset, the Port of Providence, and the South Key and East Providence in order to develop the opportunity to, to support the offshore uh, wind industry. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of big new job opportunities that are coming out of that. In particular, Orsted and Eversource have invested heavily into the Port of Providence and, and worked with organized labor to create a new career path. And that type of transition is something we're going to see throughout the discussions on climate change. When we, there's going to be new job opportunities, new economic opportunities, and Rhode Island has to take advantage of those. And I think Mayor Mitchell will agree with us on that point that it's bringing mm -hmm. some economic boom to his community. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about uh, coexisting, right? Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of claims, there are a lot of unknowns. Let's go around the table. Let's start with you, Megan. Uh, can you coexist and how can you coexist? you cannot coexist in the same place at the same time. That's really the problem. And the problem from the beginning has been that the federal government has refused to de-conflict offshore wind leases with commercial fishing grounds from the get-go. We requested that, like don't cite them on commercial fishing grounds. Mm -hmm. But the federal government failed in its procedure uh, in, in doing so. And quite frankly, my company is now the lead plaintiff um, on a lawsuit against Vineyard Wind because it's cited directly on our squid fishing grounds and we have no other recourse. No way you can get along together if they move it to different areas. If it's not on our fishing grounds and it's not in our navigational routes, but like I said, currently, um, almost the United, the whole U.S. EEZ on the East Coast is is slated both in current leases mm. and future projected leases. Mm. So, if if that is the case, then we go away. Fred, can we get along? Can we coexist? Well, <laughs> you have to understand that the majority of fishing vessels in Point Judith or Rhode Island and in this Northeast are mobile gear fishermen, and mobile gear fishermen. I don't know how they can coexist. It will be almost impossible to navigate and fish. So what we're trying to do now is find alternative gear types. If you can't go through there mobile gear wise, what else can we do? So now we're looking at fixed gear like squid jigging machines, at uh, slinky pots where you haul pots. We're looking at cultures of ikajimi where you can get more value. You get low volume but high value alternatives that maybe may help them through the next decade or so, yeah. but I don't see it for the long term. But would it be safe to say that one of the tricky things here is that the siting, the most ideal site for these wind turbines happens to be the most ideal fishing ground right. as well, mm -hmm. like the Cox Ledge we talk about mm -hmm. this. So, so you, go, you go back, th this didn't just happen today, last year, two years ago, this has been decades. Right, so how do, you, how do you coexist with those two? That's a tough thing for the governor it, and tough for you. It's, it's tough and you know, we're really trying to thread the needle on that and mm -hmm. we're really, we have some experts that really are, are looking at this and I think they're very well respected by both sides, mm -hmm. um, but they are trying to thread a needle. And like, like Megan said, a lot of the, um, the leases started years ago, 
and they they were kind of blueprinted out there. And now, the, as the permits come through, the more the more specific siting comes through through CRMC. We're really trying to trying to do damage control at that point. But we're also to, to, um, gathering a lot of data and really want to make sure that we we know the impacts, we can mitigate the impacts, and make sure that both industries can uh, can be successful. Do you think that? Or do you feel that the state hears you and is advocating uh, the way you'd like? Um, quite frankly, no, unfortunately. Okay. Um, I am a former member of the Fisherman's Advisory Board, the CRMC Fisherman's Advisory Board. And, you know, we provided the CRMC with a lot of information, um, both ecological, scientific, you know, many, many factual hard data points. Um, and CRMC threw them all the win out all the window and they awarded every single thing that Orsted asked. Um, and it, it got to the point where um, we actually wrote a letter to CRMC and we resigned. The entire Fisherman's Advisory Board resigned because we said we will not be part of political theater. Right. This process has become a mockery of what it was designed to do. And you know, our interests are being kicked to the curb in order to benefit foreign government owned wind energy companies. Hey, let me hold you right there because we don't want to get into the politics, but I want to let you have the last mm -hmm. word on that. I think I think the permitting process on these facilities is multi layered, it's complicated and it's long term and there's a lot of uncertainty in it. So a lot of the permitting is driven by the federal, the federal agencies. Um, the state of Rhode Island has a role, but it's not, it's not a yes or no role. It's a limited role to, uh, to really provide input and direction and opinions. We do the best we can on that, but ultimately it's the feds that make the decision on, on what's gonna happen. It is, a, uh, it is a complex, it is a passionate issue, and we certainly thank you mm -hmm. for yes, being part of our guys. panel yeah. uh, here tonight. Okay, up next, we are hitting the streets talking about electric vehicles. Yeah, I took one for a drive, but we'll break down the different versions and find out if the infrastructure is ready for all of us to go electric. We're just getting the early taste of what we are destined for, and we need to address the causes of that with a real sense of urgency, and the cause is fossil fuel emissions, period, end of story. All right, strong words from Rhode Island U.S. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse about the role that fossil fuels play in climate change. Of course, gas-powered cars, mm -hmm. they run on fossil fuel, and they pump out CO2. Right, and of course, there's a big push to go electric by the government and the automakers. So first, I went to Consumer Reports Test Track in Connecticut for a test drive in EV to get you some answers. The Kia EV6 is one of the better EVs that you can buy right now. Uh, that's not a Tesla, frankly. Putting electric vehicles or EVs to the test. All the cars come with this, which is telling you the battery is at 81%. Correct. And you have a range of, give or take, 215 miles. Right. Yep. Will this also show you where the nearest charging station is? It will. So it's at the Consumer Reports test track in Connecticut. Price range? Um, it starts at about forty to $45,000 and goes up from there. EVs will cost you on average more than a gas-fueled vehicle. It's the new technology. Like most EVs, it's quiet. It's generally pretty comfortable. Um, the acceleration is very smooth and quite powerful. <laughs> it depends on the car, but yeah. some... But not all EVs are the same. There are three versions. Hybrid electric vehicles, those combine a gas engine and also a battery and an electric motor, and uh, they don't necessarily need to be plugged in. Then there are plug-in hybrid vehicles. Uh, you can plug those in, and they give you a, a little all-electric charge around town or on short trips, and then the gas engine kicks in. And then there's full electric vehicles. Fully charged, you can go about 250 miles on average, except in cold weather. It needs to uh, power a heater, usually a heat pump, which, which uh, warms the battery, but also warms the car. Um, so your range will drop as, as uh, temperatures go down. And that is a concern in New England that you might not have in other parts of the country. One of the biggest challenges for EVs is the lack of infrastructure. Charging stations. There's less than 400,000 public charging stations nationwide. Not all of them can recharge all makes. Not all of them are working. And it's not like gas where you can fill up in five minutes to charge a car can take at least a half hour.
range anxiety where, oh, does the car have enough range to get me where I need to go to charging anxiety. When you're on the road, uh, you know, if you're off that 95 corridor, if you're off the major highways, uh, there are places to plug in, but will that station work? Will it be full? Uh, you know, how much is it going to cost? Uh, is it just going to be inexplicably broken that day? It doesn't seem to be enough charging stations nationwide. The mm. infrastructure is not there to necessarily support the initiative. Yeah. Range anxiety, synonymous with EVs. Other issues Consumer Reports have found? Because of the weight of the battery, EVs can go through tires quicker. And newer vehicles in their first year tend to have more problems. And that's true for EVs. EVs do come with tax credits, approximately $7,500 for new EVs, $4,000 for used EVs. But that comes with rules. There are a lot of rules that the car has to be made in North America. It has to have, um, you know, components that are sourced from specific places. The battery has to be from specific places. Also, the car can't be a really expensive car. There's, a, there's an income limit. More research is needed. How are they selling? Are they selling pretty good? It depends. It's been sort of up and down all year. Pros and cons. Do you think, though, based on your testing, that the pros outweigh the cons, or are we still kind of in this area of figuring everything out? Yeah, I, I, I do think we're in early days for EVs. And welcome back inside to our roundtable. Again, a lot of unknowns. Well, I want to start with uh, city and state government. Priscilla, you have an EV, and the big concern is the infrastructure. How many public charging stations are there in the city of Providence? So that's a great question. I can speak for the city of Providence that um, we know for a fact we have six in our public safety garage. And though those six stations that are publicly and municipally shared, um, they're some of the highest use stations in the state. So that shows that there is a demand right for for charging. Um, we also have um, an additional more than 20 um, stations, I should say, for our municipal fleet. Um, so really, we look at it as a supply and demand um, when we're thinking about the charging infrastructure. Right. The key is get, making um, electric vehicles more ac accessible and also having the charging infrastructure to go with that. So one of the things that the Smiley administration is committed to is developing a citywide strategy, not only thinking about our fleet and our infrastructure to charge municipal vehicles, but also thinking about what do our residents need um, right. as they're transitioning to EVs. And before we get to Terry, just quickly, are those all available to anyone in the public or are these just for public vehicles? The, uh, a, a, a half a dozen are in the public safety garage. So uh, anyone can go charge? Yep, anyone okay. can go charge. All right, interesting. Terry, state level? State level, the McKee administration has provided $23 million to build out um, EV infrastructure across Rhode Island in the next four years. Mm -hmm. So we started um, primarily through the lead in the Office of Energy Resources on developing new charging stations in Hopkinton and Warwick right on 95. Right, and that completes that kind of major corridor through Rhode Island. But now we have to, we really have to look statewide and figure out where the gaps are and where the investment should go. All of these will be available to the public and are uh, we're, we're hoping that we'll have a very robust ne um, network very soon. Right. And we should just point out, and I don't want you to answer this, but neither the governor or the mayor drive EV cars for their, for their uh, issued cars. So I don't, you don't, I don't you need to respond, but I just want to make that a fact to everybody. Uh, and Mark? Yeah, so I mean, this kind of maybe feeds right into a question for Meredith, and obviously reducing fossil fuel emissions, obviously that's what electric vehicles do. I know that's something you've been working on, studying air quality. Um, in the Port of Providence in particular. But that's a, that's a side of climate change that maybe goes, I would say unrecognized or maybe not as appreciated as some of the other elements, but a, a, a threat to our health nonetheless is the reduced air quality uh, with the fossil fuel emissions that are in the air. Can you talk about that? Yeah, and I think, I think for, um, for the state in particular, I think residents are really concerned about that. So when we talked about climate, and especially I think the last few decades until we've seen like a lot more evidence more directly impacting us, I think a lot of people were resistant to the idea that we really needed to, you know, to make change, right? And, and to deal with these kinds of things. And I think part of that comes from, um, part of that comes from the extremes we often deal with in New England, right? We're highly seasonal, we're used to extremes. The extremes that we're experiencing today are much more dynamic than we're used to. Sure. And so I think we really do need to think about, about solutions. And I think some residents are worried that the emphasis on climate might ignore some of the other pollution problems that we actually have in the state. Sure. I think a lot of the solutions that are being um, targeted, especially at the state level and at the city level, are co-beneficial. And so we need to keep that in mind. We need to keep our 
legacy of pollution. Um, we are the home of the Industrial Revolution. We need to keep the legacy of pollution in mind as we make changes. We have soil contamination throughout the state from legacy pollution. We have rising seas. So we need to contend with that at the same time that we're trying to build new infrastructure and get much more rel less reliance on CO2 infrastructure. Solutions, John. Let's talk about it. What are you focused on at the Nature Conservancy? Thanks, Mark. You know, Rhode Island is already a leader in climate solutions. There's so much that we're doing and so much more we need to do. Anything that we can do to protect land, to improve water quality, makes our state more resilient. In the, it repairs the damage that's already happened and it prepares us for the changes mm -hmm. that, that are coming in the future. Things like, um, things like river restoration, marsh restoration, uh, land protection, using nature-based approaches to erosion control. And this is in every city and town. It's mm. not just along the coast, but every single municipality in Rhode Island, there are things we can do, and, and there are funds available, thanks to the work the state's doing, uh, to, to do better and to use nature-based approaches to make the places more beautiful, to make them more resilient, to make them more healthful and, and just a better place to live and to work. And as, as the professor noted, we really need to think about that transition to renewable energy. I know we talked in this program about offshore wind. That's a part of the solution. Uh, solar is part of the solution. All these things have to be properly cited through a thoughtful process. And if we do it right, there's a way to actually elevate ecological protection while transitioning to a clean energy future and improving the, the resilience and the health of Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. right. Priscilla, what do you uh, uh, have to say to everybody who's watching, for you, obviously, the city of Providence, but in general, what each of us can do now? There's a lot that each of us can do. I think for me, I think about it as a Providence resident growing up in Providence and really looking at some of the inequities that Meredith mentioned in terms of poor air quality and always thinking, what could I do? Um, and then understanding the impact that fossil fuels um, have um, in, our, in our public health, but also in our safety, in our economy. Um, so I made the decision to go electric. I could afford to do that. Um, however, if you cannot afford, there are other ways that you can get involved. Um, for example, the mayor just joined the federal delegation on Monday morning um, with first students and the public school department, department to unveil four new electric buses. That's huge when you mm. think about the impact. The great thing about that, Priscilla, too, is that the kids see it at a young age education. when they get on the bus, and that's important. Absolutely. John, mm -hmm. on a state level, state residents that are watching, what can we do every day right now? I think, so our transition away from fossil fuels is a multi-headed monster, yeah. and there's a lot of opportunity here. There's a lot of things that we can do. We talked a little bit about EVs. Not everybody's ready to buy an EV at this point, but you can look at buildings, right? You can look at heat pumps. And, and as people may have to repair their heating system, consider a heat pump. There's, there's solar panels, there's batteries and power sources right. that people could invest in. But underlying all of that is energy efficiency. And just being more efficient in how you go about your day-to-day -day life helps, right? right? Um, not only with the energy efficiency, but water efficiency, weatherization, all those things help help us meet our goals. Right. We're all seeing our daily lives, and of course, we're trying to find the solutions, and I know you see it every day in your forecast. Absolutely, and that's a conversation that we're going to continue. We're going to incorporate more of this. We want to be um, helpful. We want to look toward the future, solutions, climate change is here. We're going to deal with it, and, uh, you know, we're going to... We're going to have this conversation for, for years to come. Great, and I appreciate all of you being here for this conversation. We appreciate your expertise and your time, and we'll be right back with some final thoughts in this climate conversation. And back here to the beautiful Rhode Island coastline in Matunic, where we've covered several issues concerning climate change, but there's a lot more to talk about. And I'll be continuing the conversation about our shifting climate on NBC10, and we certainly want you to be a part of that conversation as well. Yeah, until then, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. I'm Dan Cheney.